Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello and welcome to episode 57 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. I'm super excited that we are starting the month of February. Usually winter time is a period of time that I feel more lethargic. There are more sadness and a low mood, at least for me. And although in LA, we never kind of experience any cold weather, but this is something I've noticed. And I bet some of you guys might have the same kind of experiences. Anyhow, welcome to February. And for month of February, I thought each week it would be helpful if I share with you one of the podcasts that I listen to and I love because I noticed there's so many inaccurate content out there. And I wanted to make sure that you guys are getting the information that's accurate. So each week I'm going to introduce my other podcast uh, fellows and friends and hosts who are therapists and they have wonderful podcasts. So this week I'm going to talk about Hypnotize Me by my friend, Dr. Elizabeth Bonnet. She was our guest in episode 33 and we talked about sexual jealousy. So if you haven't checked that out, you can go back and listen to that episode In her podcast, she talks about the research behind hypnosis and she interviews other therapists and professionals who use hypnosis to address different challenges. So if you're curious to learn more about hypnosis, this is the podcast for you. I leave a link to the show note to her podcast. But in today's show, I'm joined by Mrs. Sandra Brown. Uh, We're going to talk about pathological love relationships and what are some of the red flags that says that you are in the wrong kind of relationship and what to do if you're involved in pathological love relationships. If you remember Dr. Sharon Cohen in the episode that we talked about sex and dating referred to Sandra's, one of Sandra's book, uh, which is called that oh, women who love psychopaths. And I thought it was fascinating. That's why I invited uh, Mrs. Sandra Brown to join us today. Sandra Brown MA is a founder of the Institute for Relational Harm Reduction and Public Pathology Education. She's a former psychotherapist in the field of psychopathology and trauma survivor. Sandra is most noted for being the first to research the effects of psychopathology and cluster B relationships on female partners, which has ignited interest in obtaining training by a mental health professional for this new and emerging genre of clientele. Her research has largely impacted the treatment field through her systematic approaches to recovery for women. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Mrs. Sandra Brown. Welcome back to another episode of Sexology Podcast. As I mentioned during the introduction, I am so excited to have Mrs. Sandra L. Brown in our show today. Sandra, welcome to our show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You know, it was so wonderful to read your book. And uh, you talked about the pattern that there are in some relationships and partners who are with individuals who are like have some personality characteristics. I thought it was fantastic. That's why I said that would be a wonderful topic to discuss in our show. Great. Looking forward to it. Great, great. So one thing that's always in my mind, sometimes I do this divorce classes and workshops. And, you know, oftentimes when there is a a separation, partners usually are because of the rupture, they are kind of hostility and frustration, which is different than pathological relationship. So in my mind, I always am curious to see what are some of the characteristics that the pathological love relationships have that the usual like high conflict is different than high conflict relationships it might be included in um, some high conflict uh, relationships but how we identify pathological love relationships we abbreviate that and call it plrs is 
it's easier to remember if we break it down by four identifiers. And this is what we look for to differentiate a PLR from just a bad breakup or a domestic violence, although there might be domestic violence in it, but from a typical domestic violence, relationship or an addictive or dysfunctional in some ways. So the four identifiers that make a PLR unique is that number one is that one of the partners in the relationship has a cluster B personality disorder, which would include borderline, narcissistic, antisocial, and or psychopathy. And so that's the first thing that we look for, that they have a partner that has some severe, dangerous and severe form of personality pathology that is inevitably going to impact the relationship. The second thing that we look for as an identifier is that the relationship dynamics follow a pattern that matches from the the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual. Cluster B disorders are called dramatic and erratic disorders. And so we look for relationship patterns that are also dramatic and erratic. If you have a partner who has a dramatic and erratic personality disorder, you're going to have a relationship full of dynamics that are dramatic and erratic. So we look for that. We look for in the survivor partner, something that we'll get into, I think, later in the broadcast, but they have unusual personality traits themselves, not as in a personality disorder, but what we call super traits, um, which which we'll touch on. But um, survivor partners will always have some personality trait elevations in certain areas. And then the last thing that we look for in PLRs is what we call the aftermath or the traumatic symptoms. There are things that are consistently present in the survivor's trauma symptoms that differentiates them often from other kinds of dysfunctional relationships. So those are the four components that make up a PLR. And if some of those are missing, then it's probably not a PLR. It might be a dysfunctional relationship, an abusive one, a DV-related one, addictive, but it may not be a full um, PLR. Thank you so much for that clarification. So can you tell us a little bit about the aftermath that you were talking about? Well, let's, if you don't mind, let's start with the super traits because... Awesome. Sure. (laughs) The the super traits will help you understand um, the aftermath. So one of the things, I've been working in personality-related science field for 30 years. First, I treated personality disordered people, and then I switched and began working with their partners. And over 30 years, I was curious that there seemed to be a pattern of the type of person that cluster Bs and psychopaths tended to end up in a relationship with. And given that those disorders are, are rather predatory, I didn't think it was a coincidence that there was something they were shopping for in their relationships. And I couldn't find any information about it. So over the years, I had been doing casual research, um, keeping our own notes about the types of personalities that these survivor partners tended to have. And then we um, engaged in some formal uh, research, and then we did another research project recently with Purdue University. And so after, after all of this, we were able to identify that there are two main trait elevations in, we only studied women that were in relationship with male cluster Bs or psychopaths. That is consistently 
significantly elevated. And one of the traits is called the trait of agreeableness. And um, that encompasses issues of the survivors tend to have what we call blind trust. Hmm. where other people who don't end up in these relationships tend to have conditional trust. They are very straightforward. They have a, a giving nature. They are highly cooperative and have high levels of empathy. And so while those are not problems in our normal everyday relationships with normal people that are not pathological that are not known to be manipulative and antagonistic, maybe our high trait in this agreeableness works really well in our job as a psychologist or a doctor or a teacher. But when you take those trait elevations and put them in a relationship with someone who is highly manipulative and antagonistic, in controlling, those become significant risk factors in that relationship. And the relationship dynamics and even the aftermath, trauma, when you have someone who has high normal agreeableness, they're going to be more significantly and traumatically impacted when they have high empathy or they're highly tolerant or cooperative or trusting because all of those elements of course are annihilated in the relationship. That is so interesting. It is consistent with my observation as a clinician that at time I work with couples and I always often see when there are like toxic relationship with the element that you mentioned that are present that the other partner usually is very kind and agreeable and empathic. So it's very interesting to hear that. So out of curiosity, why do you think some people develop like the personality uh, disorders, like narcissistic personality disorder or like, like psycho, uh, like antisocial personality features? Well, first of all, nobody goes hunting for those. <laughs> That's true. There, there's no online dating or I would like to date a psychopath. You know, those disorders are what, especially in narcissism and specifically in psychopathy, disorders of social hiding. And so the, this is part of how their relationship dynamics are different in that they don't present who they really are in the beginning. They have very good mimicking and parenting skills, so they project to her what she is looking for. In healthy dating, we are who we are, and if the person likes us, then we know they like us for us. But in, but in toxic and pathological relationships, it's, it's masked, you know, in the beginning. So no one goes looking for these. <laughs> uh, but when when they have a uh, high normal uh, traits of agreeableness, one of the elements of the, her personality that's impacted is this area about trust. They are naturally trusting. We we call it blind trust that they have a natural optimism about human nature. They tend to see people through who they are. And so if she's open and honest and trusting, then she tends to think most of human nature and other people are like that. People that don't have high agreeableness begin dating by having conditional trust, which is it's pro someone's trustworthiness is proven over and over again. But with people with high agreeableness, they go in like turning over their credit card of trust to someone and then waiting for that trust to be violated. And then they'll make a different decision. But the problem in that agreeableness trait is that they also have very high levels of tolerance. So for someone to break trust with them, it might take 50 times. For someone who doesn't have high agreeableness, 
first of all, wouldn't trust that way up front really fast. And when trust is, was broken, the relationship is broken. But, but when you have, you know, the high agreeableness factor, I think this is exactly the, what predators look for, people that are highly trusting, tolerant, empathetic. Etc. And so we, we think of this agreeableness trait as the trait that leads how they get into the relationship. We think that's the trait that the predators are looking for. And it is her natural high normal agreeableness that sort of leads and blinds her in some way in the early parts of the relationship when she might not be sensing the red flags when there's boundary violations and she's not catching them. One thing that I sometimes see that uh, the partner with the like personality disorder and this kinds of pathology at the beginning, they are very attractive. They're charming. They go above and beyond until they get the partner. Is that a pattern you see in all of those relationships or not necessarily? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the early parts of the relationship, um, this is what, what causes so much confusion in the survivor partner because the early parts of the relationship are all what we call love bombing. You know, lots and lots of attention, very charming, lots of invest, you know, investment of time in them. The relationship is very fast paced. It's very intense. And then once he feels she's secure in the relationship. Most of these people are hypersexual, so there's a lot of infidelity, and they have lots of other potential mates in the pipeline. And so the, the more the pipeline you know, fills up with all these other potentials, and he's love-bombing all of them, she gets less you know, and less attention, and he is less invested in keeping the mask on and so at some point in that relationship he the mask finally you know slips where she begins to see the pathology and um you know it creates great confusion because she's in a relationship with Jekyll and Hyde personality disorders are known for having two very different sets of relationship skills and so, you know, the love bomber's gone, and now she, she's in a relationship with a highly antagonistic, disordered person. Is that something that you feel as far as, like, when you are in finding yourself in that dynamic, is that something that people can change, or the solution would be kind of leaving this situation and the relationship? Well, there's lots of field controversy, you know, about treatment and personality disorders. Having run the largest personality disorder clinic in our state at one time, part of personality disorders is sort of this inability to sustain positive and non-manipulative change. There is a difference between being able to treat some of the symptoms of personality disorders in curing someone of a personality disorder, and our, our personalities are innate. So it's not curable. Can you teach them through dialectical behavioral therapy some skills that might make them a little less antagonistic? Yes, but part of the personality disorder, as defined in the DSM in the alternative model, talks about this inability to sustain positive, non-manipulative change. And so, to me, that's a schematic of where the relationship is going. In treatment, out of treatment, it doesn't matter. I just have not seen, you know, from the years I ran a personality disorder clinic, their ability to consistently maintain that without harming other people. And personality disorders, you know, have this Part of the problem is they don't have insight about how their behavior negatively affects others. They're always a victim, and it's always the other person's fault or the world's fault. And so when you don't have enough empathy 
intimacy, insight, and the be the ability to have positive, um, sustaining behavioral changes. What are what are we doing in counseling when those people bring that as the disorder? These are the things I cannot do. Now help me get well. Right, right. And I agree with you. I feel like, you know, as far as like, I love DBT, as you mentioned, it's very helpful with teaching people to regulate their emotions and things of that nature. But for couples work, that's challenging as far as like insight building things that, you know, it's essential part of couples work. So I can certainly see, I can share your perspective uh, with that. So one thing that I want to make sure we're talking about is about common red flags that people can kind of like when they look at the relationship, they can see that it is a red flag that it's re- this relationship is potentially pathological. Can you tell us a little bit, little bit about that? Well, first of all, they're not always going to be able to find that out up front because personality disorders and psychopathy are disorders of social hiding. They have the mask, they hide well, well into mid-relationship dynamics. That could be days, weeks, months, years, decades. And so survivors tend to beat themselves up because they didn't see it sooner. But this is part of what their disorder does well. This is their skill set. And so as much as I would like for people to know, you know, 10 red flags on a first date. <laughs> right, right. I wish. <laughs> they all want that. Just give me the 10 things. And then it's just not that simple because, because that's how the disorder is. But some of the more common issues is that the number one thing that, that I see is the pacing of the relationship. Because these people tend to have multiple relationships going at one time, they got to date fast and furious, and they want to get the person deeply bonded and connected before the mask falls. Everything in their history tells them that their mask will fall because that's what happens, and that's why they have so many people in the pipeline. And so the pacing of the relationship is very fast. You know, very quickly it turns into 24-7 status, whether constantly texting, emailing, moving in quickly. Women, you know, have married these people in very short amounts of time. And it's because that there's such a fast pace to the relationship and because there's such an experienced intensity that most normal people say they never felt before and they have mistaken that intensity that they experience some of it from the pace and just because that the personality disorder person feels intense to experience they mistake that intensity for a soulmate status and the intensity is often her experiencing a personality disorder. If any of us know people who have personality disorders or therapists who might be listening, I don't think any of us would say that a borderline narcissist, antisocial, or psychopath are not intense to experience. So then you dip that sort of in love bombing and the honeymoon phase of the relationship. And most survivors say that the pacing of the relationship and the intensity of the relationship. Most normal men that I've met are not intense to experience. In fact, they're a little hesitant, you know, maybe in in dating. It, right. it, they're not trying to get married. Into- <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> they just are, you know, they're slow. They're slower to to move into that, and so. For me, a a huge red flag is the pacing of the relationship. The other thing is, and the people, the least likely to do check up and do background checks on people they are dating are people who have high normal agreeableness, super traits that I was talking about because they have that natural optimism about human nature. 
But if people did background checks, they're going to find a lot of um, inconsistent information between the history he presents and, the, and his history you can find online. I love that. Yes. Yes. But, but these are the people least likely to ever do a background check. Um, we even did a little research on that, and the percentage was really, really low because their natural inclination is to trust people. And that's something that therapists need to you know, know and work with them about with this, this trait of agreeableness is, is that they tend to lead with their trust. Right. And I feel with this 24-7 kind of status and intensity, it's something that's attractive specifically during this age and time that there is this, like lots of loneliness and the dating usually is not, is not what it used to be and just it's sometimes super slow pace. So I can see that why some women find it very attractive. And also the other thing about the partner, I'm thinking about... Did you do, did you look into their attachment style? Did you find any pattern with their attachment style of the partners? No, um, and that's something that we've talked about looking at. You know, we're try, we were just trying to get through the super trait <laughs> research, but, but I'm sure there's probably some level of consistency and attachment style because just even with the trait of agreeableness, that trait is called the relationship investment trait. So they are very relationship oriented, not in a needy and dependent way, but in that relationships and not just intimate relationships, their work relationships, their friendships, they derive a lot of enjoyment and meaning out of that. And so when you have someone who by nature, just how their personality is hardwired, comes into this world loving people and finding great enjoyment in that. And then, then they're in this fast-paced love bombing, blow your wheels off your car with so much <laughs> right. kind of thing. And they're relationship-oriented anyway. It's why they think that this is such soulmate status because no one has sort of equaled their relationship investment the way they tend to love people. And so here comes someone that seems to value relationships as much as she does. And um, it seems like a match made in heaven. Right. And, you know, as you mentioned, because people, the pathological partner usually is so good with hiding their uh, personality traits, it takes a while for the partner oftentimes to kind of recognize that this is this is something that's not working or this is a toxic relationship. So what do you recommend the partner do when they realize that this, they are potentially in a relationship that, that is a pathological love relationship? Well, they need to get some education specifically about these toxic kinds of relationships because they are different. A little bit of the research we did, people end up going to five or six therapists before finding someone who recognizes this isn't just, you know, a dysfunctional relationship. So they need the specifics about the, the personality disorder to understand that you're not going to go to a Imago therapy weekend and get this out of him. We're not going to Harvell Hendrix him into this, right? you know, into, uh, into new, a new skill set. So, and, and that's typically what happens is that they've gone to these couples marathon kind of weekends thinking, because they don't understand personality disorder. So I always, we always work with our survivors and give them a neuroscience training on what is wrong with the hardwired parts of cluster B and psychopaths brain. That this is not a medication issue. This is not a therapy issue. This is not. We begin by looking at the parts of the brain that are impacted in the empathy region and the insight region and why 
you know, waiting on this sustained positive change is going to take her whole lifetime. So it has to start with good psychoeducational material. And a lot of it takes care of itself from there. When they get the right kind of information, when they can reasonably assume that their partner has some level of pathology, it, when they can see their unusual dramatic and erratic relationship dynamics in the literature, when they can see their super traits and and when they can see their aftermath, trauma highlighted, you know, that, that's a big chunk of it because then you're down to just treating the trauma and then working with them kind of preventatively with their own super traits so that this doesn't happen again. But so much can be done with good psychoeducational material. That's that's wonderful because I would imagine like many of the partners they can they think like there there is something they've done or there there have been any like maybe there was a secret uh, recipe that they haven't found. All right, and I I always tell them there's no book written you know happily ever after with a psychopath or or with a narcissist. There's nothing she could have done to make that different. He came into the world you know, with pathology or the propensity for it. And she's just not that powerful to undo an innate personality structure. Right, right. I've noticed that we are toward the end of our time, but I know that you you do have lots of wonderful content around this material and websites and many great things. So if our listeners would like to get a contact with you, get a hold of you, what would be the best way? If it's survivors and they're looking for more information or books and products, they can go to saferelationshipsmagazine.com. If it's a therapist and she would like more training in this, we have a professional association for training therapists, and they can go to survivortreatment.com. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and research with us. This was a lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mrs. Sandra Brown. It was fascinating to learn about her research and some of the common pattern that she sees among women who are in the pathological love relationships, because oftentimes People think these women are, you know, they don't have good qualities or it's lack of confidence or many other things. But it's interestingly, she was talking about how great qualities like empathy and being agreeable kind of can make you potential kind of candidate for this uh, psychopath and people with access to personality disorders such as borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. And at the end, I just wanted to express my gratitude to a few of you guys who took time to write us an honest review. I wanted to say thank you to Elizabeth Cush, AQ LCSW, DV Gator, and Saifaya for giving me honest feedback about what do they think about this show. And for the rest of you, I would love it if you can drop a line for us in Apple Podcasts or Stitchers or wherever you're listening to this podcast and subscribe to our show so uh, we can rank higher in the iTunes. And also, I want to hear your thoughts. Generally, I'm curious and interested. Anyhow, as always, it's wonderful to be part of your day and I'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.